Closed captioning of this program is brought to you in part by Pariah Pickups. What you want, what you need, what you love. Visit pariahpickups.com and at Pariah Pickups on Instagram. And LoudTracks.com. Visit LoudTracks.com to get your favorite band merchandise and purchase a Jeremy White Podcast t-shirt to support the channel. Hi, I'm Joe Elliott, and you are watching The Jeremy White Show. The Jeremy White Podcast. Tuesdays at 12 p.m. Eastern, 9 a.m. Pacific. Available wherever you get your podcasts. What's Hello. up? How you doing? Good day. Welcome to Montreal. What are you? Uh, Montreal. We're both uh, uh, yep. in uh, Montreal. And uh, it, uh, it, uh, it behooves us to talk about the uh, triple uh, CD collection here because uh, when you did the X tour, you came and did a radio promo uh, jaunt in Montreal. And uh, at the end of the day, you recorded uh, two songs in a private studio. You did... Um, you had Malvin there, you had Phil there, and you did uh, Two Steps Behind and some other song. I think it was Now. It was Now. Yeah, that's what we did. We always did Now and Two Steps because they normally had us up at 7 a.m. for the breakfast stuff. Yep. And yeah. now, singing at 7 a.m. No, no, no. <laughs> so, you know, it's kind of keep it simple, you know. <laughs> well, yeah. Uh, like, you know, we were promoting that new record of Two Steps. It's just been a huge hit in Canada as well. So it seemed like a... Actually, 10 years previous in fairness, but um, it was a big hit. So those two songs seem to be the perfect combination. Yeah, I've always wondered what happened to those two songs. They were recorded in, that, in a private studio in Montreal and they just sort of vanished. I always thought they'd show up as a bonus track somewhere, but hopefully someday. Well, like most places that we went to stations all over Canada, all over the North America, they would record them. So there's actually probably about 20 versions of both those songs. Which we, we love. Monster <laughs> EP, but it would just bore people to death. Right. Not, me. Not me. I'm a diehard. But uh, here we go. We're talking about this. If I can get it to uh, show up on the screen. Oh, it's not there showing up. on. But I bought it. Uh, I bought it. I'm a proud owner. Uh, Jeremy, oh, go ahead. Man. Yeah, I'm still waiting for my box set to come in Amazon. They're, they're just being bitches lately, man. <laughs> God, can't get none from them over here. But we got, I got mine. But uh, talk yeah. to me about the uh, the collection here. Let, let's let me start off with uh, the Yeah album. What was the recording process on that? Because over the years, we've heard all kinds of rumors that it wasn't really a band thing. That you did your songs and and Viv did his songs, and 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 then eventually they're sort of like all you know Viv demos and Joe demos and Phil demos that you just sort of stuck together on the album. What is the story behind the Yeah album? Uh, that that couldn't be further from the truth. Okay. That's what happened with Year Two. If you look at the, um, the what we finally got them all in the one spot, when we'd finished doing Yeah, we were aware of the fact that the, the, it was the fashion at the time in the late 90s and the early noughties to, if you put in a single out, it, they, the label asked for three bonus tracks. <laughs> mm. um, so, you know, say you, you, you bust your nuts for a year recording 10 tracks, and then somebody says, well, there might be three or four singles on here. So now you need another 12 songs. You know, come on. So luckily, with it being a, a, a project where we were doing other people's songs, we just stuck to the format. And after we'd finished the actual album, we all carried on. We all, everybody went home, but everybody had little studios. So everybody, you know, we just said, let's look. No agenda. Do anything you want. And they were the bonus tracks. And if there's some cross-pollination between a couple of band members, great, you know. I think Phil stuck around in my studio for a while. So me and him did When I'm Dead and Gone, which is a song by a, a British band called McGuinness Flint. Sav was living in Ireland at the time, so he came over, and me and Sav did a Lindisfarne tune called Winter Song. I did Space Oddity, but I didn't actually do it in fairness for that session. I did it when I'd revamped my studio and I wanted to test all the stuff. So I notoriously just do a cover just because you don't have to worry about the song. And um, my dad's birthday was coming up and he's a huge fan of that song. So I recorded my own version of Space on it for my dad and we ended up using it as one of the bonus tracks. I also covered a, a Slade song, a Jabriah song. Vivian sent me the backing track of, of American Girl by Tom Petty, so I sang that. 
Um, Phil did Search and Destroy by Iggy and the Stooges. Sav did a like a punk rock version of a Queen ballad called Dear Friends. So it was a completely eclectic collection of tunes. And that is true about those songs that are now year two. But yeah, the actual album. No, we sat down and we had we we brainstormed which songs we wanted to do. And we pretty much had the 12 main 12 songs down within about an hour. Mm. Wow. You, um, you did a cover of Hanging on the Telephone. Is it the Nerves version or the Blondie's version? Well, obviously it's the Blondie version because until <laughs> until I got nerdy myself, I didn't even know it wasn't a Blondie song. Right. You know? um, written by a guy called Jack Lee, who used to be in his band called The Nerves. So we covered a cover. <laughs> it's right. a great one. Um, you know, the first song that we, we – everybody threw songs in the hat, and we barely argued about any of them. But the one song that all five of us went, oh, God, yeah, we've got to do that, was Badfinger, no matter what, because mm-hmm. it's just a killer tune. And well, then you know, – That's the thing. It's, you know, the, it, like, I was going to say the – like Bowie, me and, me and Phil are huge Bowie fans, so the rest of the guys know that. So they come along. Vivian was really into doing free because of Kossoff and Lizzie because of Brian Robertson. So we were all fine with that. Um, there wasn't really anything that, that we said, oh, really? Are you kidding me? In fact, we almost did a 15. I think we did 14 songs, 12 made the record, and then a couple of spares. We almost did Sparks. This time ain't big enough for the both of us. But it's just it was just a keyboard too far. <laughs> for the album we were trying to make, so we had to abandon it. But it's a great song. Yeah, you, if that was the case, you needed the Ronald keyboard to go with it. Yeah, yeah. and, and, and I, guy. I spent my uh, my uh, my youth of of that year uh, chasing down all the bonus tracks. Of, was it you know Walmart and Target? But uh, let me just ask you about this because you you do cover Bowie a lot, and you do had the Cybernauts project. Um, talk to me about your love of David Bowie, and and at some point, do we see the Cybernaut project come back? Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm hoping so. Me and Phil will be talking about it. You know, I mean, sadly, we don't, we no longer have Trevor Boulder or Dick Decent, who was our keyboard player. Um, we've got Woody, so if we're going to do it, uh, Woody's still alive and well and kicking and playing around with Tony Bosconti's. Um, Man of Soul, the World Project, we're doing Bowie songs. Um, if we can coax him into the studio to do a couple of backing tracks, drums tracks, me and Phil can cover the bass and the guitars and the acoustics, what we need to do, and I can certainly cover the piano bits should we decide to do something a little more piano-y, you know. So mm. um, it would be a three-piece version of the Cybernauts to bolster the, you know, maybe a 20th anniversary re-release of that album, you know. It's interesting you should bring that up because obviously when we were picking a Bowie song, we kind of tried to avoid anything we'd already done on Cybernauts. It would have been a bit silly, really. So Driving Saturday was the perfect choice because it's a phenomenal song. And it's the one song that everybody just seems to go, yeah, we should avoid anything off Cybernauts. Let's go, let's go with this one, innit? Along with like Waterloo Sunset, it was more of a kind of a, a slower version than say the faster stuff like Hellraiser and um, 10538 Overture or Thin Lizzy or whatever. You know, even the free song is very up tempo. So it was nice to put it in. I wouldn't call it a ballad, but it was just slower tempo. Um, I've I've actually sung. I, somebody. Somebody worked this out for me the other week, whether it be live versions or studio versions. I've covered, I think, 32 Bowie songs in my Jeez. career. So <laughs> you could say I'm a bit of a fan. <laughs> a bit of a fan. And that Cybernauts uh, live album is just fantastic. I love it. Yeah. Love, always and loved it, it. A kind of an accident as well. You know, we were, we'd done the Mick Ronson Memorial Show um, in 94. And there was this kind of like unfinished business factor because we only played for 30 minutes. And we said, like, why don't we do some, you know, they, they were opening this um, Mick Ronson Memorial stage in the, his hometown of Hull. And they wanted us to get back together and play on it. So we said, well, if we're going to do that, let's do a few gigs. So we worked out a hell of a lot more songs. And um, when we were playing the uh, Olympia Theatre in Dublin, which is literally about seven, eight miles from my house, 
we went down to sound, you know, we were sound checking, and I just kind of had this epiphany went, Christ, why aren't we recording this? So our sound guy put all the ADAP machines in a taxi and sent them down, and Ron and our sound guy plugged them all in, and we recorded the gig, and thank God we did, because it was just one of those magical moments, you know, and it was it was a very strange period of time for everybody concerned because the day after we played the Olympia Theatre, who was playing it? David Bowie. So we went the Perfect. night after and it's the, the, the Olympia Theatre in Dublin is a bit like the Muppet Theatre where you've got the box with Waldorf and Statler in it. We were in one of those <laughs> and it was the first time that Trevor Boulder and Woody Woodman say had been in the same room as Bowie since the last gig they did in 1973. Wow. So it was like, wow, this is bizarre, you know. It's just yeah, strange. that is. You couldn't really yeah, plan that any better, you know. No, total accident, but you know, good one. Yeah, okay. serendipity is the best way. Yeah. I, I want to bring it back to the X album really quickly. So, two of my favorite songs of that album are "Long Long Way to Go" and Four Letter Word." And I was just re-listening to "Long Long Way to Go" last night, and I mean. It's weird because I was looking it up and I was like, man, like this is such a Phil Collins, like Joe Elliott, Def Leppard song. And then I realized, I looked at the writing credits, it's not really a Def Leppard song. Uh, well, it is because it sounds like those anyway. It, it um, does. We just didn't write it, you know. Mm -hmm. the, we've had a, we've had a, a kind of a, a, a much bigger effect on pop writers than rock writers. There aren't many. In it would be fair to say after 1983, there was a lot of Def Leppard soundalikes. Mm -hmm. um, right up to 87, and then Kurt Cobain kicked all that lot in the touch. Um, but the one thing that's never gone away is the love of this band from pop writers uh, and country people. You know, people like Faith Hill, Tim McGraw, yeah. Taylor Swift. Um, well, I was saying to Phil Collin last week that I heard the best Def Leppard song on modern country radio the other day. It was, it was just basically pour some sugar on me, but... With country lyrics, yeah. I now. mean, even when when Mutt Lang was producing uh, Shania Twain, a lot of that stuff was like we used to say it's, it's Def Leppard on fiddles, you know. Yeah. Alison Krauss, another one, st stunning artist, won more Grammys than than I mean, she's been greedy. I've never had one. She's got like twenty three or something. Yeah, <laughs> she, she's a big Leopard fan, you know. And a lot of the pop writers are big Leopard fans. I remember doing radio shows where. You know, you're the only rock band on it, and it's like Pink and Jewel and that lot. And these guys yeah. wouldn't get off the stage. They wanted to stay and watch us. I, I remember I kept turning around and looking at Pink, dancing and singing Sugar. You know, I mean, these guys, um, Katy Perry, same kind of thing. You know, there's a lot of, the, a lot of these um, pop artists and the, yeah. the writers for these pop bands we're big fans of what we did, the songwriting that we did when we worked with Mo Lang, and it's resonated for a long, long time. By the way, Miley, have, you, uh, Miley, have you... Miley Cyrus is another one. We met her when we did a, a, a TV thing about 18 months ago, and she was like just, you know, it's booking list for her apparently. So, you know, it, it's it's weird. Now, are, are you uh, are you both aware of the Lionel Richie version of A Long, Long Way to Go? Yes. It is fantastic. Yeah. It is. It's really good. And, and the shame of it was that he recorded his after we did, but the, the, the reason ours kind of didn't really take off or get used was the, the fact that he was prioritized, you mm -hmm. know, because he's Lionel Richie. So right. well, we had like 10, 11 other songs, so it was okay. Well, let's see you bring up writing with Mutt, because it's like, what was the biggest difference of writing with Mutt versus writing without him? Without Mutt. Well, actually, in fairness, not much now because he's always this like spectre hanging over your shoulder. <laughs> it's like uh, when you write a song, what you learn from him becomes part of you. So it's, you know, you join the army and you start off as a private and you work your way up to a corporal and you become a sergeant or whatever. When you become the guy that's dishing out the orders, you remember the guy that was dishing them out to you and you take from him the bits that you like and you leave behind the bits that you don't. Um, and work, we worked on and off with Mutt for 11 years. And we weren't just this, well, I said, most of us certainly weren't these like stupid little kids that are just like, oh, wow, we're working with Mutt Lang. And they'd just 
go out to the pub when he's doing so. I used we all hung around in the control room, hovering over his shoulder, watching what he was doing, mm. and learning from the knob twiddling part. But the majority of the work was nothing to do with the knob twiddling. It was the attitude. It was the the knowledge of not not being too precious to all your ideas. You know, you come in with an idea and sometimes you go, oh, this is the best thing I've ever done. And then somebody will go, ah, I'm not really sure about that, sunshine. And, and it, you know, it knocks you back down a little bit. We went through so many mo- moments with Mo, moments with Mo, where we think we had this, you know, the next stairway to heaven. And he'd go, well, the, the chorus might make a good verse, you're like, oh, really? Okay. <laughs> uh, but we were we were clay. You know, we were really early 20s. We started working with him on High and Dry. We did our first album with Tom, Tom Allen. We'd been playing those songs live for nearly 18 months, so there's no way we were in any mood to want to start reinventing those songs. But when he came to writing High and Dry, they were brand new ideas, half-finished ideas. We weren't that close to them. So when Mutt would say, take a song like When the Rain Falls, which turned into Let It Go, um, he'd say, well, dump the lyrics because they're crap and speed up, uh, slow down the song. I think we slowed it down, make it a bit more like Highway to Hell type stuff. And you're like, okay, I get it. Because Highway to Hell was the first ACDC record where their tempos came down. It wasn't all speed stuff, you know. Yeah. And it made more sense, you get more chord changes in. It gave it a groove. And that's what Mutt taught us. So by the time we got to do in Panamania with him, everything we'd done on Iron Drive, we took it on the road for a year, and it all kind of just sank in. It wasn't like, oh, no, we, I've got to learn this. And it's like, you know, it wasn't like cramming for an exam. It, it sunk in gradually, like learning to talk when you're a baby, you know. And so by the time we get to 1982 doing Pyromania, We've, we're we're kind of on board with his theories and his ideas, but you know it was a two way street. You've got to give credit to Bob Lang. He wasn't a a dictator. He would be the first to go. Hmm, I don't know. Anybody got any ideas? Mm-hmm. And if Phil or Seth, well, it'd be yeah. Phil came in halfway through. It would have been Pete and Steve and Sav musically more more than me at the time. Mm. Um, and somebody had come up with an idea, and then he go, "Okay, I like that. Let's let's run with that." So we were all. It was a f- total five five way writing project, if you like. The four out front guys and and Mo, we 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 came up with the melodies and the lyrics as a team. Yeah, yeah. But you know, some of the songs, like you know, things like "Lady Strange," was as it was. He did he didn't touch it because he thought it's great. I'll leave it alone. It's, it's perfect. So you know, it wasn't the most important song on the record, but. He was happy enough that what we came up with was right. It was bringing on the heartbreak. He did a hell of a lot of work on that one. Um, so by the time we get to do an album, it was like, you know, um, Slang and Euphoria and, and as we're talking about it, X. All the stuff that we learned from working with him, plus our own ideas of what not to do and just going off your own way and, and, you know, it's like David Carradine in Kung Fu. Sooner or later, you bang your wrists on the side of the burning tray and you go out into the desert and figure it out. And that's what we wanted to do, you know. So I think we we, we got it down pretty quick. Hmm. What is it about Mutt's writing style, though? Like, do you come in, you know, or Phil comes in with a guitar riff or some, or does he have a melody? Like, you know, it's, it's so interesting to listen to a song like Armageddon it, or, um, you know, I had a big conversation with Phil about Rocket, and it's like, how does a song like that come about? Like, do you come in with a white light? Like, do you come with, like, does that happen in the mix? Or uh, I tell what you, is well, the process? Let's take that song as an example, right? We were in Holland, uh, staying in a, in a tiny little village called Lustrecht, the studio was in Visselord, which is 30 minute drive. So every day we'd commute in and out. And opposite our crappy little hotel, there was a sauna. And we used to frequent this sauna on days off and hang out and stuff. And one day I'm in there and somebody's playing Burundi Black, which is this African tribe type music. And I just thought, wow, this would be awesome for a rock song. So I asked them if I could borrow the cassette. And I made a loop of one particular part of it. And I shoved it into my little Fostex 4 track and I came up with some guitar chords. And I played it to the guys a couple of days later and they were like raving about this. Mm. So I'm like going, oh, this is awesome. This is great. So 
Phil took my basic co chorus chords and inverted half of them, so we actually had a chorus. And then we, what you do is you come up with a melody, and because you haven't got any words, you just go la, la, la. You just la, la where the words go until a phrase comes to mind. And Rocket came to mind. And we started singing it, Rocket, yeah, and then da 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 And then when we decided that, like, why don't we use it as a metaphor, the Rocket is the vehicle through our youth of all the great bands and songs that resonated with us, which is why it's what they call a name song or, a, you know, a name check song. And once we started on that and he got to the chorus bit, I just blurted out as a Lou Reed fan, Satellite of Love, which fitted perfect, you know, because it's space, rocket, satellite. And then he's like, oh, you can't, you can't ignore that. So in that went and we had the chorus. And then we just worked backwards from there. The bridge had got nothing to do with it, really, uh, lyrically. But then the verses were all just like bands or, you know, or fake bands like Benny and the Jets, which is actually a song, but it's a song about a fake band called Benny and the Jets by Elton John. And we would name check, uh, like Killer Queen by Queen. And, you know, Jet Black was, I think, the drummer in the shadows, you know. I mean, which, any phrases that worked, we were totally nicking from the Mark Bolan school of songwriting where the phonetics of it was more important than the lyrical content. We weren't trying to be Bob Dylan. We were trying to do the hubcap diamond star halo, where it just sounds great, no matter what language you're listening to. If some Japanese fan hears that, they go, sounds great, even though they don't know what it means. <laughs> it's not red lorry, yellow lorry, or whatever. It, it's phonetically friendly. So yes. that's, what we, that's what we did on that particular song. Mm. Oh, and all of Hysteria, because I, I remember buying it uh, for the very first day it came out and listening to it going, Razor, laser, what? What are they talking about? Pour some water. And it was, it was, it was great that it just rhythmically fit your ears. It just sounded good. So much more important, you know. I mean, yeah. if you if you want to be Bob Dylan, giddy up, you know. Um, <laughs> these days, we do tend to write. I mean, in fairness, you take songs like "God's a War" off Hysteria. It's a very serious song, as was "Die Hard" the Hunter of Pyromania. But we don't want to be that all the time. You know, we've always said we wanted to be a band that had the power of ACDC, but the, the the kind of variety of a band like Queen. And it's the same thing. You know, you've got somebody to love, and then you've got We Will Rock You. And that's where we, we want to, you know, it's, it's Dunderhead, but it's great Dunderhead. Um, some of the, the greatest songs are the Joan Jett song. It was a cover of an Arrows tune. It's, you know, it was a worldwide phenomenon and still is as it should be, because I love rock and roll. Put another coin in the jukebox, baby. I mean, if Chuck Berry had written that 20 years earlier, he'd have got a Nobel Peace Prize. Mm. Um, well, thank God Alan uh, Merrill wrote that. That was... Uh, yeah, absolutely. Too. You know, um, and yeah, I mean, going back to Chuck Berry, he was... A, people think, oh, Chuck Berry's the guy that invented the duck walk and played that one... Da -da 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 riff. But he's actually a poet. He was actually a poet. The guy was one of the best lyricists of all time in, in the in the genre of rock and roll, you know. And then you've got Little Richard who had the voice. So he didn't even need words. He just sang a wop, bop, a loo, bop, a lot, bam, boom, tootie, fruity, or Rudy. So That's what fantastic. The, what does that mean? You know, a lot of woos. Who cares? <laughs> who cares? Who cares? You know, he was amazing. And, you know, to this day I get chills when I hear things like Good Golly Miss Molly because... It's it's what it you know it, it it's what it's where it all came from. And Jerry Lee Lewis had a, a similar kind of vibe. We took a lot of that stuff and dressed it up. People never seem to pick up on on certain bits of our music that are so to us obviously borrowed. You know, when there's a song on Hysteria called um, "Run Riot," and the whole format of it is "Summertime Blues" by Eddie Cochran. It's absolutely just singing over the drums, and then the guitar lick comes in between the first line and the second line of the verse. Doesn't sound anything like it, but the, the actual structure of the song is is lifted from a 50s vibe. It's, it's the best way to deal with something that's massively fast, like Run Riot, you know. Yeah. It was it was fun working with Mo. It was, he, he always made it fun. It was never deadly serious. It wasn't like, you know, some of these producers like Phil Spector that walks into the control room with a fucking handgun to try and get the best performance out of right. yeah he would 
take a break if it wasn't quite working, and we go out and play table football for 15 minutes, fall about laughing, go back in and nail it. You yeah. know, he, he, he was like, a, he wasn't just a producer, he was a, a mate and a, a colleague and we, somebody we could lean on and, and you know, he, he, not, his shoulders were very broad and he was, he liked working with us. Like, that's why we're the only band he ever worked with for so long. Because, you know, it was just, the humour was, it just matched perfectly. Yeah. It's all about humour, all about the humour. Let me ask you this. A lot of people that I've spoken to that have worked with Mutt, they specifically point out the fact that he really, really made them a better singer. Now, what is it about Mutt's process in the studio when it comes to tracking vocals that just completely elevates your performance? Um, the train factor, as I call it. Do it again. Do it again. Do it again. <laughs> you know, he won't take the first take. He wants to see if you've got a better one. Mm. So it's like a bridge. You know, what you'll do is like sometimes you'll peak. You, you'll reach a certain level of performance here. You'll go past it and you'll come down the other side and that's the one he'll take. And it's exactly the same level as the one that you were trying 20 minutes earlier. But your voice would have been in much better condition if we'd have stopped there instead of here. <laughs> uh, you know, I, I remember meeting um, Lou Graham uh, at Wembley uh, Arena in 84. Yeah. They were promoting Foreigner. In 84? Uh, well, was, no, it would have been whatever. It was, it was Agent there. Provocateur, probably. Oh, possibly, yeah. Mm -hmm. And um, I walked into their dressing room and he went, Hi, nice to meet you. So tell me, did Moat make you think you couldn't sing either? First thing out of his mouth, you know. Um, Brian Adams would probably tell you the same thing. Most singers would. Strangely enough, though, Mutt's, it's not about perfection, because all you've got to do is listen to the Boomtown Rats albums and listen to Bob Geldof. It's about the attitude. It's all about the tune, man. It's all attitude about, it doesn't matter if it's not perfectly in tune, whatever it was. You listen to Ozzy and Alice Cooper and Ian Hunter and Gary Holton from the Heavy Metal Kids. They had a vibe. It wasn't about singing like Paul Rogers. It was getting your thing across. John Lydon in the Sex Pistols, you know, whether it be Joel Strummer in The Clash. It was awesome, but it wasn't what you might call correct singing right. as we would you know, the, say the guy from Kansas who's like could sing the phone book and make you sound good. Right. But it's it's you're doing your own thing, and that's what gives it its its independence. It's what gives it its um, its character. Char you know, its character. Mm. So huh? what Mutt would do was he would push you as hard as he possibly could until you, as a singer, you just gave him that look, and you go, okay, okay, fine, mm -hmm. it's fine. It's fine, you know. Yeah. I don't, think than, once, I don't think he ever once told me that's really good. He said, yeah, it's fine. It's okay. It's fine. It's good. <laughs> yeah. Moving on. Yeah. Moving on. <laughs> like, wow, okay. The yeah. studio is costing us a lot. We got to get out of here. Uh, let me just very, quickly ask you about it. It's very grounded to do that. It's very grounded. It's like everything he did to us as a band, and he wasn't just a singer. He'd do the same thing to any drummer, a bass player, a guitarist. He pushes them to their absolute limits. And then you listen back to it after you go, can't believe that's me. And then yeah. you have to take that now as your new standard to improve on, which is why we always got better. Yeah. Well, I'm going to get off of mud for a second, but I got to say uh, some of the greatest news in 2021 is that Brian Adams is making an album with him. It's like, oh, it's going to be. A, is he now? Oh, yes, he is. It's going to be yeah. an absolute masterpiece. I thought, I thought Mutt had kind of retired after that Muse album, but. Um, no, nope, he's, yeah. he's, he's, he's back. Let me, let me just ask you about, since we're talking about vocally and the band being pushed, you start off in the new wave of British heavy metal. You're there with Tigers of Pantang and Ethel the Frog and then Def Leppard. And you move away from that. Uh, talk to me about getting yourself sort of away from that pub culture and, and moving on to that next level and, and sort of uh, refining your sound, polishing up your sound. Well, it's funny you should mention that because we didn't move away from anything because we were never in it. We right. were put there by other people. Okay. And we would sit there kicking and screaming because youth being what it is, you're like going, don't lump me in with that lot. So we were always, to me, there was only ever two bands that came out of that movement and it was us and Iron Maiden that have actually made something yeah. of themselves. There was a lot of potential that fell by the, the wayside. To, to me, putting either of those two bands, us and Maiden, in the Nawabham thing is like saying that the Beatles were part of the Mersey sound. 
Mm. They weren't. They were the fucking Beatles. They they invented everything. You know, everybody else followed in their footsteps and their slipstream. Um, a lot of these bands, it was just it was just because of the time period. Disco was dying on its ass. New wave was taking over as a pop phenomenon right now rather than punk. Um, and it was time for some rock music back in because 1975, it was kind of like, that was the last time that there was any love for at the, t- at the time for bands like Purple, Heap, Zeppelin, Sabbath. It was, then punk came in and kicked everybody up the arse. Um, but then when that didn't last and the new wave stuff was a bit more pop, there was rock coming back in it, but influenced by punk. I mean, you listen to early Maiden, it was punk, especially with Diano on vocals. You listen to our first album, so it's like Wasted and Get Your Rocks Off were very influenced by punk. Even if they don't sound like punk songs, short 10, 15 second guitar solos instead of these things that lasted longer than a Beatles song, you know? Mm. Um, so it, it's an interesting thing that People always lumped us into that. I mean, in America, for example, they got we got lumped into the hair metal thing. It's like you do how you know all of a sudden we disappeared at the end of 1983, and we don't reappear until August 87. Something happens in Los Angeles while we're living in a frigging windmill in Holland, and we get roped into it. It's like. It doesn't make any sense, you know. I mean, I'd be the first to admit that, you know, with bands like Warren's Cherry Pie is a, you know, it's, come on, it sounds like sugar. Um, not that some of our stuff didn't sound like other people that came before us, but there was an, an, an overload of that kind of stuff. But the fact is that some lazy media folk would lump us in with it, even though we were A, British, B, never spent any time on Sunset Boulevard. And as I said, we were living in, in just outside Amsterdam watching windmills wind go around, you know, <laughs> and visiting saunas. I mean, it was, it couldn't be, what came out of us musically had nothing to do with anything else. It was totally us. So, you know, we've, like I said, we've always wanted to be a standalone band. And I've been accused year, for decades now of being all oh, very defensive, isn't it? And it's not being defensive. It's just like trying to explain it to people that don't listen. And for, you know, you do it, you do a round of press, for a new album and you 3,000 interviews and then the next time you put a record out, you're back to square one again. It didn't work, which is why when we did the Year album, we thought, well, you know what? They don't listen when we talk. Maybe they will listen when we sing and dance, which is why you've got Blondie, David Essex, Roxy Music, Bowie, Boland, you know, all that kind of stuff. Thanks. No smoke on the water, no rock and roll, no... You know, paranoid. We, no. We, that's not us. You know, it was a party. It was, yeah. and and no matter what is is the their cover version is the ultimate version. It is better than the original. It just it yeah. just. Well, is. I, I no find offense. that to accept because I I even when it's your own stuff, the the song that inspired us to want to do it is always the blessed version for me. Mm. But um, the surviving member of of uh, Badfinger, whose name I've, I I. To be quite honest, I don't think I ever... I think he was the drummer. He he was a friend of Paul Chapman, who was in UFO. Yeah, I got Uh, my UFO shirt on right here. Yeah, there you go. He was living in Florida, and uh, Tonka brought brought the guy from Badfinger to the the gig, and he actually said to him, he says, it's the best version of a Badfinger song I've ever heard. You know, um, so that, you know, it was was cute that a lot of the artists that, that heard our versions would actually get in touch and go, wow. A Paul Rogers, David Bowie, Badfinger, the, the one remaining member of Badfinger. You know, David Essex, when he heard Rock On, was like blown away by it, you know, because we did it differently, you know. Yeah. Um, it's nice to get that kind of recognition, but it doesn't really, it doesn't, doesn't sell records. It doesn't, doesn't make you get any taller. Mm-hmm. But it was a great album for us to do at the time we did it. We'd, I'd been begging everybody to do one since, I don't know, 85 you know, because I was a huge fan of pinups, Bowie's pinups. Um, and there's some great cover uh, covers albums out there. And there's some really bad yeah. ones. Yeah. Well, but, the, uh, the, the the Tesla ones, reel to reel, are fantastic. Yeah, there's some great stuff on, on that, especially if you get the bonus discs that's got 
the, the acoustic older, versions older, of, uh, okay. yeah. But they did like Sly and the Family Stone and they did James Gang. I mean, they did all the stuff that meant something to them. Uh, oddly enough, in 1988, me and Phil tried to talk Tesla into doing No Matter What because we figured it would be a perfect song for those guys because they'd done Little Susie. And it's like, you want to do something else? It's going to get you up in the charts. But they didn't want to do it. So it was pretty obvious that we were going to at some stage. Do you think there would have been a different perception of you guys had you done a covers record in the mid 80s? It would have been a mistake mm. because we didn't have enough stuff under our belt at the time. I think the, the thing about the covers record was it came at a perfect time. We'd finished doing the uh, the ex tour, uh, right. which kind of finished in two thousand end of 2003. And we hadn't written any songs anyway. You know, we were thinking about, should we take a year off? And we kind of almost did. But at the same time, it's like, well, I don't want to take a whole year off and not do anything. So they said, well, now, if we haven't got any songs written yet, let's do the covers album now, which is what we did. So we actually started the basics of it in 2004. And we worked through it until 2005. We were... We went out on tour with Brian Adams in the baseball stadiums and yeah. we kind of had the record in the can, but we held it back because the label at the time wanted to put out the best of Def Leppard. <laughs> mm. So it's like, okay, it's that time of our career, is it? Where you, you, The only awards you're ever going to win from now on are Lifetime Achievement Awards. <laughs> oh. And that's where, that's where we were. So we held the album back until 2006 after we'd kind of got all that stuff out of the way. And lo and behold... It actually gave us the biggest tour we'd had since Hysteria because, you know, small facts really, but no matter what, and our version of Rock On held the number one spot on American rock radio airplay for like five, six weeks. So that there was a lot of heat on that record as it came out, as the tour with Journey went out there. So we got the opportunity to play a bunch of songs on that record and not not be doing it to force the issue. They were actually on the radio. So we could play, um, say, we'd maybe open with Hellraiser because it's a great number, but we, within the set, mixing with our other stuff, we'd do Rock On and we would do um, No Matter What, and they felt comfortable in the set because they'd been on the radio. Yeah. Let me ask you, you know, you just touched on Brian Adams and you talked about bands sort of trying to sound like you in the 80s. What did you think of Waking Up the Neighbors when it came out? Oh, I got into trouble with this one. I thought it sounded a bit bit close to the bone. Um, yeah. And Brian was a bit pissed off at me and fair play to him. I mean, he should have been. Mm. But the, what it is, it's exactly the same as High and Dry sounding like ACDC. Mm. What you've got is you've got the same producer, possibly using the same engineer in the same studio. When we did High and Dry, Mutt put Rick's drums exactly where Phil Rudd's drums were using the same mics to mic them up. We use, we probably use the same cabs and amps that Angus and Malcolm used that, that Steve and Pete used. So mm. there's going to be a thing where, so somebody says, high and dry sounds like highway to hell. I go, touche, it does, you know. So I, I mouthed off a little too much there and I've apologized profusely to Brian many times since. But yeah, I mean, that's the Mutt Lang factor, you know, Brian Adams could easily be a member of Def Leppard. He could be the singer of Def Leppard. There's a, there's a cross-pollination because he's a pop rock artist and he works with the same producer that we did and we're a pop rock band. So mm. it's, it's you know, it, things, eras do sound similar. You put on a 60s CD and there's loads of bands that sound like the Beatles. You put on a 70s CD and there's loads of bands that all sound like Zeppelin or Purple or whatever. And in the 80s, it got ridiculous, you know. So, you know, um, yeah, there, there's a similarity, but that doesn't take away from the fact that it was a really good record. Yeah, you know? one of it, one of his absolute I'm best. I'm probably a little bit jealous that some of those songs weren't on our on our. <laughs> well, I tell they, they would have worked. I tell Mitch all the time, like you know, don't drop that bomb on me. He's one of the best songs Def Leppard never recorded. <laughs> that is true. Yeah, it is. Let, let me ask you just real, real quick, coming into the X album. Uh, you do Euphoria, which was sort of a, a throwback to the early Def Leppard sound. Slang, an album that I happen to love, uh, was a departure. What was it? What was your sort of state of mind going into X? Because it does come off as a, as a very pop record, and I think it's a great record. Uh, but oh, oh, Absolutely. When we did Slang in 90, 
Six. Recorded it in 95, released it in 96. Um, we were reacting against our back catalogue. We were reacting against the, tri the, the, the three albums we'd done, the trilogy of albums that were huge productions, all driven by Mutt. Even though Adrenalize was co-produced, you know, we were already spreading our wings a little further and, and he was happy to have us co-produce that record and he only really got involved in the mixing of it. Um, when he came to doing Slang, we changed as people. You know, they say that apparently every cell in your body changes every seven years, so you're not yeah. really the same person anymore. Of course I not. think that's what we were. By the time we were doing Slang, we were in our mid-30s, early to mid-30s. So we were starting to experience stuff that we'd never thought we'd ever experience when we did, say, Pyromania. We were experiencing marriage, birth, divorce, death. Some really happy subjects there. Uh, well, a couple of them. Yeah. Are. But um, they were affecting our writing. You know, we like gives us a different bit. Now, we knew for well that most Def Leppard fans don't want to hear us do that kind of thing. But as artists, we would have died if we hadn't have done slang. We wouldn't, I wouldn't be here talking to you now if we yeah. hadn't have gone back down to ground zero. We but, had to do it. So, but by the time we got around to doing Euphoria in 99, it had been eight years since Adrenalize. So even us were like going, oh, you know, I really miss the big choruses and this kind of stuff. And bands like Sugar Ray were bringing a bit of joy back to music. It wasn't all death and destruction from Seattle. Um, so when he got, you know, once we got that out of the way, when he came to doing um, the X album, all these ideas were getting thrown around to go and work with the guys in, in, uh, in Sweden. And we got to work in Polar Studios, which is where ABBA did all their hits. Mm. So it puts you into a pop headspace, you know. We were writing songs that were very, for the first time in our, first time in our lives, I think, Americanized. Mm. There's a song on side one, or, you know, <laughs> let's just see. Actually, there was no side one back then. There was nope. no vibe. CDs. I think it's You're like so beautiful. Track, track two or track three called Every Day. Mm. Um, so which to me sounds like us kind of, mimicking Cheap Trick, you know, who are one of my favorite bands of all time. We weren't li lifting from Bowie, Boland, Slade, Sweet anymore. We were lifting from Aerosmith and, and Cheap Trick because we'd never done it. And we just thought it might be a nice thing to try. Yeah, because so, I mean, you listen to four you know, letter word. It, I had was. Yeah, you it listen was to four great. letter word. It's, it's like your ACDC song, you know? Yeah, you know, that, that would have fitted brilliantly on High and Dry. You know, <laughs> because it's, it is that kind of, you know, um, bit of a song to sing. Phil wrote that one. Right. He's writing his register, but he's writing the crack of mine. It took me ages to get my head around it. But it, it's it's a great tune, you know, yeah. and there's there's some great stuff on that record. I mean, I'm, it it's an album that I would, I would definitely put in our top five or six albums that we ever made just because of the variety on it. It starts off as a, a real poppy album. And it gets heavier as it goes along. Yeah. Well, one of the best uh, songs that didn't make it onto X is Perfect Girl. And I'm so glad that you guys finally released it officially, yeah. in the new box set. What made you guys, you know, when Phil brought you guys that song Perfect Girl, what made you guys rework it and turn it into Gravity? I don't know. I can't remember. <laughs> it's the <laughs> honest answer. I think we were probably thinking it was a bit wussy. So, mm -hmm. you know, um, we Perfect needed Girl to, was great. You know, we lived, we, we lived with it for a while and something this is what normally happens it's it's the emperor's new clothes it takes one person to go uh i don't know and then we was <laughs> oh, okay well, what do you think's wrong with it i'm oh, sure about that chorus okay so well let's think of someone else then and everybody else doesn't go no it's perfect they go okay let's see what we can do because if we can make it better let's you know whether we did make it better is is a moot point really the fact is i think we let it out on the website in 99 yep. or 2000 just because it was the thing to do. Bowie had just started Bowie Net and he was doing all this mad stuff on the internet and we think, oh, I've got to play Keep Up now with everybody else. Mm. So we let this song go out, which in fairness we'd forgotten about. You know, we'd forgotten all about it. You can't find the master tapes anywhere. The version we've got is lifted off the website. It's in mono because mm. it's such a squashed file. But it's the historical value of it is so much more important than the actual quality. 
So that's why this is a warts and all collection, all four yeah. box sets, because there will be a fourth. As mm -hmm. you can tell, when you slide this one alongside of one and right. two, there's a quarter of the logo missing. So it doesn't take Sherlock Holmes to figure it out, you know. So what's going to become? What's going to become? The history of the, of the song is more important than the quality of it, you know. Mm. It's a great song. Uh, so, what is the fourth box set going to be then? That's what I was just going to ask. It's like you know, uh, when, well, are gonna get, get, when are we going to get? When are we going to get the hysteria? Demos? Have to kill you, you know. So, well, I'll take mean, my chances. <laughs> there's going to be um, a lot of live stuff. Um, we've got some um, nothing that you don't know exists, but it's kind of a little bit like the the year two B side covers, if you like. Mm. They've it's fallen by the wayside, or the they're too new to have sunk into people's DNA. They go, oh, I remember that, yeah. So there's, there's, we've got a bunch of stuff. Um, depending on when it comes out, there might be a new Leopard record that would slip slip in with the last one from 2014. But there's, you know, there's the there's the live stuff from Vegas, both 2013 and 2000. Um, was it 18 or 19? I can't remember. It's, it was 19. might have been 18. Oh, well, let me ask you. You have COVID has messed me up. I think it was 19. <laughs> um, and then there's you know the stuff from the the uh, O2 Arena in London. So there's there's loads alive, and there's loads of bits of left over, and there's stuff that we haven't discovered yet. That's the beauty right. of it because this one's only just coming out. We will bide our time and and make sure that we've tied it up as best we can because it's nothing worse than you you put out the entire back catalog and then somebody goes oh we forgot about this one <laughs> well i can so, help you with that oh, let, let me the, the great thing if there is a great thing about covid for people like us is it's given us chances to organize our libraries and stuff right and alphabeticalize everything and i mean my 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 kind of archive room was like the kind of proverbial cartoon thing where you open the door and all the pots and pans fall on your head when you do it. I've now took it all out and put it and sorted it out. And we've got tons of stuff on the go now. They've got the, the vault, the Def Leppard vault, yeah. where we're starting to discover and release bit at a time photos that we've never seen the light of day. And, and there'll be bits of material musically that never saw the light of the day that will come out box sets through the vault We've got lots of irons in the fire at the moment. We're writing new material. So that fourth box set could, it will be a, a hodgepodge of everything, really. Yeah. Before and I get four, to the... Uh... All three of them are. I mean, there's all sorts of mad, you know, kind of 12-inch extended mixes or live versions of this, that, and the other that all fell by the wayside after a period of time. Uh, before I get to the uh, potential new album, you did a bunch of stuff for, for iTunes. You did the Lost Sessions EP. You you redid Rock of Ages in 2012. You redid uh, Pour Some Sugar. I mean, you had, you had started re-recording this stuff. What will happen to that? Because that hasn't appeared on any box set. Well, there you go, then. You just answered your own question. Box four is screaming out for those. We also redid Hysteria. Yeah. Right. You know, um, because at the time we were at war with the label. And so we said, right, we're just going to do re-records right. because they were they were messing with us. But then, lo and behold, new person under the old umbrella, if you like. And the and the Reznikov, uh, Bruce Reznikov in LA and David Rowe in London are fans. And they came to the table and said, We've got to get this feud over with so he said all right then let's put your cards on the table and let's see what happens which is why we finally bowed down to streaming from i think it was january 18 we've we've put all our stuff up for streaming and we're we're pushing nearly we're, we're rapidly approaching two and a half billion streams in that short period of time wow, wow. Is, you know you can argue well what you missed out on but i think the fact that we did it when we did it gave it its value yeah you know um, and we are now nicely, uh, we've got a, a, a total loving with the label at the moment. So we stopped doing the re-records, you know. Mm. Um, there was no need because why, why would you bother if you don't have to? Yeah. Let me ask you, Joe, I I'm really curious about this. You know, talking about this fourth potential box set. Out of all the stuff that you have in the vault, is there any hysteria ever era demos laying around? Like, would you consider putting out stuff, you know, like with the Mutt Guide vocal or like the additional bits that you left out of the mix or different remixes and stuff? Or well, well yeah, yeah, there's there's always a possibility. We don't forget there will be a 40th anniversary re-release of Hysteria. We've 
we did put our foot down and say we're not doing any more 35th or 37th anniversary versions. 33rd saving, and one third. Yeah, we were saving it for the. I mean, when the when the old regime, for example, were in charge, they put the the double deluxe version of Hysteria out on the 19th anniversary. And I mean, I'm sorry, but we just all went. Can't you just wait one year? You know, and it was like those were the things that were like pissing us off as a band. You know, yep. it's all gone away now. We don't want anything out until the 40th. There's no value in doing it. It's not fair on the fans until we really go through the archives and find stuff like that. You know, I will say this out loud: there are no, nothing survived of the Jim Jim Steinman sessions. They'll never see the light of day because there isn't anything. Mm. It all got wiped a bit at a time as we recorded the record. Um, but there are rough mixes. There's maybe instrumental versions of certain things. The yeah. sad thing about Hysteria is most of the tapes got lost. So you can't even do a remix because it was all digital. So a lot of the stuff was never even on tape. It was just on hard drives and run it concurrently with tape. Yeah. Sitting you know? in the synclavier and the, the yes, fair light. Yes, exactly. And... and then the things, they they get shoved into a corner, eaten by spiders, and then when you plug them in, they don't work. Or you can't plug them in because the machine you plug them into doesn't exist anymore. Mm. You know, it's because it was technology was in its very infancy at the time. Nowadays, it's easy. All our old stuff, like analog tapes, we've had them transferred into Pro Tools. We can do everything with them. But there's a mid-period where we kind of scuppered. Um, but there's definitely stuff there. So, yeah, I mean, yeah. we may say most of the hysteria stuff for a, a 40th anniversary box set, but, mm. you know, you, it's like the uh, that non-Bond film, Never Say Never Again, you know. Um, we, we, we don't say absolutely not because we get talked into things and then we sometimes go, actually, I don't know what we were thinking when we said we wouldn't do it. Because we really should. Things become more valuable the older they get. Mm. I think a lot of bands might look at a four-year-old song and go, God, I don't want that coming out. But when it's 40 years old, you go with some kind of nostalgia. You go, oh, this is pretty cool. Yeah. Take the last Who album. There's a, there's a demo that Pete Townsend did in 1965, I think it is, called um, Got Nothing to Prove Anymore. But he put a brand new string arrangement on it. So it's like a 20, 2019 string arrangement on a 1965 demo. And it's brilliant. It's way more valuable than, say, a song from 2008. That might become valuable in 20 years' time. Yeah. No. And, and yeah, I ask about the Hysteria stuff because it's like one of my favorite scenes in the classic albums DVD that you guys did on Hysteria during Love Bites, for example, on like that last verse where you pulled out that entire like vocoder part of Mart, uh, of Mutt singing like the I don't touch you too much, baby. And he's got like that. Cause you're really alone, yeah. Oh, like, yeah. Walker Brothers. We had yeah, that was yeah. our Walker Brothers moment. We hated it. <laughs> you know, we said, no, I'm not doing that. You know, you, sometimes we'd go for a coffee and he'd come back and look, so I've done this thing. So what you think? And we like, we. Ugh, what are you doing? <laughs> no. The, we, the, this, yeah, I think every record, this, look at the Beatles stuff. We go through the anthology. They start finding stuff and putting versions out where they, they do something different. There's a long lost verse for um, While well, Maggie Char Gently Weeps and all that kind of stuff. You know, yeah. you, The decisions that you make on the fly, they either come back to haunt you or you're glad of them. And again, Maybe in uh, six years' time, we'll find that quite amusing and say, fine, let's let it go out, you know. But, yeah. Uh, I still get the shudders when I think about it, you know. <laughs> <laughs> well, I love your reaction in the DVD. You're like, that is so not us. We, we can't do that. Like, <laughs> I mean, We're all about the vocals, but that was just one vocal too far, you know. Yeah, yeah. Here's a, one last question for me, just talking about vocals on, like, working with Mutt and stuff. How many overdubs would you do to get those big backing vocals on those records? Thousands. Oh, well, that's how it seemed. This is how we started out doing it. We did it a little bit on High and Dry, but on Pyromania, we wanted to take it up a notch so that people would go, holy crap, the same way that they did when they heard Bowie in Rhapsody or something, you know. Mm. We, we had some great yardsticks to judge ourselves against, like Boston's first album or any Queen album from Sheer Art Attack onwards up to at least the works. Um, and they used to multi-track everything. And I remember talking to Brian and he said, 
yeah, we all sang the same part. We didn't sing like, I do the middle one, Roger does the high and Freddie did the low. We all sang the high and then we all sang the middle and then we all sang the low. And that's kind of what we did. But we would get a, a two track mix of the song and put it onto a fresh piece of 24 track tape, which would leave us 22 empty tracks. And we would sing the chorus on 20 of those tracks and bounce it down onto one of the two remaining blank ones mm. and then wipe those 20 and do them all again and bounce those onto the final empty track. So we had it in stereo, different performance. And so if there was say five of us around the mic times 20, that's a hundred voices. And then you, I mean, just do the math. It's, it's hundreds and hundreds of voices. Wow. Yeah. That's it's crazy. amazing. Uh, boy, it gave us a unique sound. And the, the, the weird thing is we never had a problem pulling it off live because Phil's voice, when he joined the band, sounds like 20 people singing anyway. Mm. He's got that Rod Stewart, Bonnie Tyler rip. And it sounds like you put a bit of a harmonizer on it. It sounds like a choir. So Sav's voice fits in beautifully. Now that Vivian is in the band, he takes a lot of the mud stuff. He's got an insanely high, full voice. Yeah. Uh, and I fall somewhere in the middle. I've got a high, falsetto -y, gruff voice like Brian Johnson. Vivian's is full voice. Mm. Um, you know, I mean, he could have he could have been in the Isley Brothers if he wanted to. Right. <laughs> you know, he's got, that, he's got that tone. But between the four of us, we'll normally sacrifice one harmony in a three part so that two of us can do a two part doubled, you know, two of us singing one and two of us singing the other. And it, you, you kind of hear the third one in your head anyway. So, you know, right. we, we don't try and replicate it the way that say super tramp might do it. You can't tell the difference between the album and the live, but with us, it's, it's a representation the way, the way Queen were, we, we, we make records and then we play live. I mean, can you imagine when Queen did Bohemian Rhapsody, did they really honestly go, holy crap, how are we going to do this live? I don't think they did. I think they just said, we're making a piece of art. We'll worry about that lot later on. This is our one chance to get it exactly how we hear it in our heads. And that's how we approach all our records. So if there's things that are physically impossible to do live, but it makes the song sound better, we do it. Absolutely. Yeah. And uh, I'll, I'll wrap up on this one just real quick. How important was music video to the band's success? Because I never heard Def Leppard on Montreal radio in 82 or 83, but I saw you on MTV. I saw you on Much Music. And of course, when Hysteria comes out, the premiere of Women, big day, big event. How important was music television to Def Leppard? Well, you must have been really young in 83 then because we were all over the place in 83 in Canada. We were one of the biggest selling records of the year. True, but not on radio. Yeah, I'm sorry, well, it was. Maybe well, Montreal. Ma Montreal, uh, yeah. We never played Canada before 83, and we did an entire sold-out tour. Okay. I mean, we put so many people in, in, in the arena in London, Ontario, a cloud formed in the building because of the amount of sweat in the, in the room. It was, it was incredible. I've got photographs of it somewhere. It was bizarre. Um, but, yeah, it was very important. If you think about just a handful of artists and you say, Michael Jackson, I don't think about a song. I think about the Thriller video or Billie Jean. If you talk about Duran Duran, I just see Simon sat on the front of a, of a boat. Boat, yeah. You know, in a, in a funky suit. Um, or I see Bowie. For let's dance, China girl, yep. um, photograph the video for photograph. Whenever they do, kind of, you know, little screenshot stuff of the, you know what represented the year of 1983. More often than not, you see the slowed down leap off the drum riser of me le jumping towards the camera with the Union Jack on. It became as iconic as any song that the music video was made for. But it was like tennis. It was bouncing back and forth over the net, like a like a warm up. You know, we 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 did the video, and the song starts getting requested on the radio, and then the radio airplay goes up, and that makes the video plays go up, and it just kept bouncing like this. When when we were making 
pyromania. We were unaware that in America MTV had started because it was August the 1st, 1981. We were already back home. It was telexes and telephone calls in those days. Mm. People didn't go, oh, this new thing. And it was only in about a handful of cities at the time. But what did happen was, because they had so little to play, they were choosing from maybe 300 videos. Bring on the Heartbreak got um, a lot of airplay. And High and Dry and Let It Go got a little bit of airplay. But then Heartbreak started getting requested on radio because of the plays and multiple spins it got on MTV. And then it started to sell again. So this album that kind of peaked at about quarter of a million copies, all of a sudden, by the time we were wrapping up Pyromania, had gone gold. So there was an audience ready. And when we delivered that video for Photograph, it just went bang. You know, we started off in, um, in the marquee, Phil Collins' first ever gig with the band in February of 83. By the time we got to September, we were in Jack Murphy Stadium in front of 55,000 people in San Diego. And we went from opening for Billy Squire for three or four weeks to soft sales on the first two or three weeks of the, uh, of the headline tour when we had um, John Butcher Axis and Crocus out with us. But by June, which is only a month or so later, we were selling out faster than Zeppelin's last tour in places like Detroit and, and Chicago and stuff like that. And then we were able to get into Canada for the first time ever. It was massive, you know, but sadly it lasted about a decade and then it was gone. Wow. There you go. Hmm. Well, thank you, Joe. Uh, absolute pleasure. Uh, Jeremy? Yeah, you know what? Before we wrap, because we've got three minutes left, I want to get as much out of this as I can, because I have a really <laughs> geeky, weird question to ask you, okay? On the final chorus of the song Hysteria, when you're say there's somebody saying the, the super high, get hysterical, hysteria. Who is singing that part? I think it's Mutt. And I think it's, I think it's me and Muck combined. Because mm. we'd be the only two that can get that high. I mean, Vivian right. can, but he wasn't in the band at the time. Yeah. So it's either just Muck or it's me and Muck. I don't, I, it's a long time. Asking yeah. me to remember a, a 20 minute part of a, you know, to, to start recording and finishing that bit. He's yeah. like, ask me, what did I have for breakfast that day? <laughs> but it, it almost has like a bit of like a robotic sound to it. So it's like, you know, w was there times where you guys would record stuff at a lower part then put it into the Fairlight or Synclavier and like pitch it up or use a yeah, we do all sorts of like If you listen to the middle section of Rocket, you can hear everything sped down. They sound, we always call it the monk chants. It sounds like some Baroque monks chanting yeah. in that middle bit of Rocket. That is some other part of a song put into a synclavier and just played like -na -na, triggering it -na -na, -na -na, and then you could put it on a loop and it'll just play on its own um we did that on a, a, loads of stuff there's the beginning of rocket is i think it's we're fighting for the gods of war backwards yeah that thing was -na 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 is i think it's we're fighting for the gods of war. so we we did all sorts of stuff like we'd speed things up we'd slow it down we had massive amounts of fun with the studio. It became the sixth member of the band, or the seventh member, if you want to call Mutt, the sixth member of the band. We went down so many avenues that we didn't use because mm. we would say to Mutt, Ooh, what does that button do? And he'd go, I don't know, let's find out. And you could, like, reverse something instantly. Whereas when you remember, like, way down inside on the end of Whole Lot of Love, to mm -hmm. get that effect where the echo came before Robert's voice, they had to turn the tape backwards and upside down and put it in a record so that it came before he did it. With, with all this stuff that we had in, in 85, 86, 87, you just hit this button and it did it. So we would do a lot of stuff and live with it for four or five days and then go, nah, it's crap. So we'd spend a week doing something that didn't even make the record. So the album didn't really take that long to make as performance wise, it took a long time to make because we were trying to replicate stuff that the Beatles did on things like Tomorrow Never Knows, where you've got all this one-off mad seagull sounds at the front. They had to do that by holding the tape out across the room. 
we could do all this kind of stuff by just typing it in, you know. So we did a lot of stuff like that. Absolutely, we did. Yeah, because hmm. like I said, we we were into we were trying to make a record where the bits like that weren't that important to do live. Whether we do them or not it doesn't matter. Listen to Queen; they don't do half their harmonies. If you listen to some old, you know, stuff with Fred, yeah. there's, there's yeah. massive chunks missing out of all their songs. But it, it doesn't matter. It's not not the point. Yeah, I'll, uh, that's true. The box set volume three is available now. I bought mine. I love it. Good I love matter. everything that far. Yep. And uh, just, uh, I'll finish on this. Uh, just, uh, Joe, thank you. you. You've given me uh, 35 years of absolute enjoyment and, and great times. So uh, to you and to John Bon Jovi, just thank you. You've been a big part of my life. Merci. I will tell John next time I speak to him. Thank you. There you it's go. A very good friend of mine. Good. Awesome. Yes, thank you. Thanks, Merci. guys. Enjoyed that. Thanks, Merci. Joe. We'll see you soon. Cheers. See you see in you Montreal. Year, a look. Yep. Stadium tour. Here we come. Fingers crossed. <laughs> see you <Cheers>. there. <laughs> Bye. 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 See you later. <laughs>